You know, in the interest of time, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Sally Jewell. I'm the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, and uh, it is a privilege to welcome all of you here. Jerry Abramson, who is uh, Deputy Assistant to the President for Intergovernmental Affairs, was just over with all of the governors, uh, several here, and the President, uh, who we anticipated wrapping up at 12.30, went right until 1 o'clock. Uh, so that's why Jerry's not here yet. But I think in the interest of time, particularly as this is live streamed, and I know that there are people not just in this room, but uh, uh, all over the uh, Pacific and the Caribbean, as well as the, the uh, continental U.S. that are watching this, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, I'd like to add a tremendous welcome to all of you. My colleagues within the federal family, thank you for being here. Uh, our colleagues from the territories uh, across the, uh, the world and uh, in the Pacific and Caribbean, a warm welcome to you and thank you for traveling so many miles to be here. I know that there is uh, an event that several of you would like to be at that's taking place right now, I think, in Palau. Um, so it's particularly uh, appreciated that you're here and I know that your teams are also representing you there. I do want to start by uh, just a, a, a quick word of remembrance to uh, the late uh, Governor from the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, Eloy Enos, uh, departed just uh, a few months back. Um, and so if you join me just in a quick moment of silence uh, as we remember him, I would appreciate it. Thank you all. Um, served his people well and uh, I know has an able successor, Governor Torres. Uh, so congratulations to you on stepping into this role and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you as we did with your predecessor. Uh, my colleague Esther Kiaina is a very able Assistant Secretary for Insular Areas for the United States. Um, she was born in Guam. She was raised uh, in Hawaii and Guam and brings a really unique and helpful perspective uh, being from island communities herself. So it is great to have uh, Esther at my side and so many of these things. Jerry Abramson also co-chairs this body and makes sure that uh, all of us in the federal family on behalf, of the, uh, on behalf of the Obama administration are represented here and uh, we want to let all of you know the importance of uh, our relationship with you and the, the uh, importance of your representation here. Um, even though it is... Uh, uh, non-voting when it comes to the U.S. Congress. You do have friends within the White House uh, and uh, within the administration. We want to make sure we, we uphold our relationships. Um, and here's Jerry. So, uh, Jerry, I started without you. <laughs> great to see you. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. I, we, you had a great excuse. You had a great excuse. Um, I was just beginning to uh, uh, do introductions. I did a quick welcome on behalf of uh, the White House and the administration. Um, I was uh, just acknowledging our governors, but if you are ready, I think I'll turn it to you uh, to go back to the regular order. Good. Sir? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. I, I apologize for being late. When you have 44 governors, give or take, uh, in, the, uh, in the building, uh, it is uh, not as easy to move them from point A to point B, and the President just concluded uh, having an opportunity to inter interact with uh, those from around the country and, and uh, also in the territory. So it went exceptionally well. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity once again to be with you and to join uh, my co-chair. You know, I, I, I stop and think as the president was saying uh, just uh, 30 minutes ago, um, it's the last time that he would have an opportunity to meet with the governors. And this could very well be in this setting the last time that we'll have an opportunity to engage and, and interact with everyone. And I hope folks remember that, um, you know, the President felt so strongly about this organization, about ensuring that the uh, interagency group on insular uh, areas had a White House presence with it. Uh, Secretary Jewell does an outstanding job. The Interior Department is very, very engaged. But the President very much wanted the White House to be present and uh, before I got here uh, decided that the position that I hold, which has an opportunity to interact with governors and legislators and counties and mayors, uh, should also be here uh, engaging and, and uh, interacting with all of you. 
It's been a pleasure to meet with, I, I think I've met with all three of you. I know two of you have been in my office and probably all three to be able to work on some of the issues that are unique uh, to the territories and to ensure that uh, the agencies throughout uh, the federal government is aware, understands. Um, I was meeting with a, a District of Columbia representative uh, because the governor from Guam was unable to be here. And she, oh, there she is. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, an issue came up that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, and I was able to reach out and uh, the, they'll be calling you in the morning to be able to follow up. Um, so that's the way it works. And this president has felt so strongly about ensuring that we're working in concert together and in a coordinated fashion with all of our cabinets that are, that are represented here and all of those folks who make such a difference in the areas uh, where you all live. And those of you who are engaged with those areas know how important they are to the entire United States and to this president most specifically. So I thank you for waiting for me to arrive and uh, let, me, let me turn it over to the Secretary. And again, I know we're focusing on economic development, which makes a difference. Um, makes a difference everywhere, Congresswoman. It's always nice to see you. Sorry I didn't say hello. Virgin Islands represented. Uh, it, it, economic development is so important to not only the elected officials uh, in the territories, but as importantly uh, to the citizens that they represent. And anything that we can do in a coordinated way to ensure that job opportunities are available quality quality jobs to be able to provide for the families of those who are working is, is an awfully important part also of the President's focus. So thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to open it up and um, uh, Madam Secretary, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Great, thank you, Jerry, and thanks for the, uh, the way you have engaged with the White House. Uh, this is our final year and part of this is how do you set momentum going so it doesn't change or that there's a a clear pathway to the future. And uh, so there are many career staff from the federal family that are here, uh, not just the political staff who will be evaporate in 11 months and uh, may come to some of your uh, territories to vacation. <laughs> that would be very nice if we find something warm. But um, we do wanna make sure that the good progress that's happened uh, between uh, your territories and this administration uh, the insular areas continues well into the future. Uh, governors, it's a, a privilege to be in your company. Uh, thank you for making the trip over here. Congresswoman, uh, thank you for your representation. Um, it uh, is very important, I think, that we have a close relationship. Department of the Interior is, in, in many cases, the advocate and conduit that can help uh, move your issues forward. So uh, it's really helpful to be here. and. Um, uh, it's so easy for people to forget that uh, you are the United States of America as part of this great country. Um, and uh, so anything that we can do to put you back on the radar in an important way is part of our jobs as well as part of yours. So um, I know that we have uh, a lot of subject matter that we're working on together. Economic policy, compact impact, um, Healthcare, climate change, which has been a big focus of this administration in working with you uh, because you are on the front lines in so many ways um, in, in terms of feeling the impact. Uh, tourism, energy development, energy is far more expensive. The farther you get away from these energy centers, we understand that. And um, this body is developing some really smart policies uh, to carve out stronger, more sustainable economic solutions. So uh, I did take a trip to Guam this last summer. Very, very interesting always to be out on the ground to see the issues, the very real issues that you're facing. Um, I did some work with uh, some young people out on the ground on removing invasive species, um, dealing with uh, the rhinoceros beetle. Um, other invasive species in the island, of course, the brown tree snake is always a great fear for many of the uh, Pacific Island nations and the risk uh, that happens with um, those little critters that can uh, hide out in particularly on uh, airplanes in wheel wells and, and wreak havoc on your bird populations. Um, we talked a lot about economic development and tourism. I visited a hospital in Guam, uh, which is struggling with, uh, you know, the demand on the services there, and I think has had some grant funding here relatively recently, but uh, big issues. 
Healthcare compact impact, which is a big issue, uh, particularly in Guam and Hawaii, uh, but across territories. And I think with the um, uh, climate change that you're seeing that's very real, we're going to see more and more climate refugees and translocations as a result of that. And that is something that uh, is very important for all of us to pay attention to. Esther and her team have done a great job of uh, starting with a new direction, which is a one-stop. So we opened a one-stop in Guam and one in Hawaii, predominantly focusing on those who are migrating into communities that need support to understand what all the various programs are from across the federal family uh, that are available to them, uh, which hopefully will reduce the burden of compact impact on uh, those that are taking so many, many people in. So I want to compliment Esther and her team for uh, the very good work that they've done there. Um, I'll also say that uh, you should be enormously proud of the representation of the island communities <coughs> at the Council of Parties meeting in Paris on climate change. Uh, I was there early on. I did meet with um, the contingent from the Marshall Islands. But the Pacific Island nations made a very clear point to all of the nations assembled at the COP21 in Paris, and that is that climate change is very real for us right now. And they didn't wag a finger and say, it's your fault. They said, we will lead by example and reduce our own carbon footprint but we need your help because our island nations are disappearing and in some cases are faced with coastal erosion or really feeling uh, the impacts. And I, uh, I have to say it was a very, very powerful argument. And the argument made by those island nations was let's not look at 2% increase in temperature for the planet. Let's look at one and a half because 2% means basically uh, we will be uh, refugees. Uh, many of our, our uh, islands will not be inhabitable. We won't have fresh water. We won't have uh, the ability to uh, subsist um, with our economies. That was very, very powerful. And uh, I will be making a trip to the Virgin Islands. I haven't uh, um, talked about that with uh, all of you yet, but I think it's very important <coughs> as we think about uh, our relationship in the Caribbean that um, I have an opportunity to to learn firsthand about the issues that you face there. So that will be happening in the coming weeks. And we look forward, uh, Governor and Congresswoman, to working with you on uh, what makes the most sense for that visit to advance the issues that are of, of best importance to you. Uh, so um, I think it's very clear from Esther's engagement, uh, from the engagement of across the administration, that we're not interested in just flying in and flying out to your uh, regions, your communities. We're interested in actually learning what's going on on the ground and what we can do to be uh, part of that. We do have uh, um, a budget that's now out. I'm going to be defending it in the first of four hearings uh, starting tomorrow. We have $33 million in the budget for compact impact uh, grants for Guam and uh, CNMI and Hawaii. Uh, it is a small fraction of what you actually spend, and we'd love to see uh, more coming out of uh, Congress, but it does reflect an ongoing commitment to recognizing that issue, and we would welcome ongoing engagement with you to, uh, to continue to raise awareness. We also have $5 million, which will help transform the infrastructure uh, for energy <coughs> sectors from 100 percent reliance on fossil fuel to a more clean and sustainable energy future, and we know that's really, really important. It's a um, huge expense to rely on imported uh, fossil fuels to drive the energy, and yet you have to have energy to be successful. And yet, uh, with wind energy and solar, really the price coming down, uh, we, we know that there are great opportunities, particularly with our colleagues in the Department of Energy, uh, to help uh, make progress there. Um, your natural resources are vulnerable. We know that. Uh, there's $2 million for natural resource protection, which includes the Coral Reef Initiative as well as uh, ongoing efforts to address invasive species, like a couple that I mentioned just from my visit to Guam, but it's true in every one of, um, of the uh, territories. And then $4 million to provide support for community, landscape, and infrastructure adaptation and resilience uh, initiatives that relate to climate change and the very real issues you're feeling on the ground. So uh, my colleague uh, Esther Kiaina is really a champion on uh, climate change initiatives. 
She's been doing uh, great work also on uh, supporting resilience. And uh, later today, she's going to be leading some discussions to reflect your concerns and enc encourage discussions around, uh, sorry? Yes, that's where I'm going, tomorrow. about uh, self-determination. So that's yes. this afternoon, correct? Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. So we'll be uh, working closely with you on advancing self-determination. Uh, I think it is very clear just from my three years in this job that uh, you don't have a voice as much as you could. And it's part of our job to do that and part of your jobs. And so finding ways uh, to improve on that, I think, is, is really important. So. Esther's panel is uh, with the Virgin Islands, America, and Samoa, and Guam. And uh, the UN li lists your territories as uh, non-self-governing. Uh, we know self-determination is very important, and your voice is important. So uh, we are here to serve all American people, including American people within our territories. Uh, we want to work collaboratively with you to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of all of the people that you represent, all of the people in the United States uh, are uh, well taken care of. And uh, I wish you great success in this IGIA meeting. Uh, we are at your beck and call, and I look forward to uh, ongoing discussions. So with that, uh, anything else you would like to say, Jerry? I'm going to stay until about five minutes to two when I've got to actually uh, go work on my uh, hearing for your budget and our budget collectively. So. Um, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Esther Kia Aina, for the next part of the program. Esther. Thank you so much, Secretary Jewell, and thank you, Mr. Abramson, for hosting us here at the White House. Welcome, half a day, and talofa, to our governors and delegates from the U.S. territories who have joined us today. I know that Governor Calvo, Congresswoman Berdalio, and Congresswoman Radawagon are in the Pacific, but they are ably represented by their chiefs of staff. It has been an honor for me as the Assistant Secretary for Insular Areas to work with all of you in the advancement of territorial issues within the federal government. Since last year's IGIA, we have made significant progress on the four issues we profiled. First, on the climate change front. Our Office of Insular Affairs has worked hard with our Interior Department's landscape conservation cooperatives and climate <coughs> science centers in the Pacific and Caribbean to advance capacity building on climate change adaptation and resiliency strategies, including a historic gathering of federal and territorial officials on the island of Guam last June, co-hosted co -hosted by Guam Governor Calvo. We are currently awaiting climate change adaptation planning and implementation grant applications due next week, which will further advance the coordination and planning processes of resiliency initiatives on the ground in the islands. Second, workforce development continues to be a challenge across all territories. And we have endeavored to work with each territory by providing grants for apprenticeship programs, public-private youth job programs, and establishing a paid summer internship program in Washington, DC for college students to expand their future job opportunities with the federal government. Two of our strongest job training capacity building partnerships are with the U.S. Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority and the American Samoa Power Authority. And of course, we continue to work with the U.S. Departments of Labor and Homeland Security on territorial specific issues, including the labor and immigration challenges with the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Third. Last year's tourism discussion focused on the impediments hindering tourism in the islands, including transportation, infrastructure, visa processing times, and immigration laws. We have officials here from the US Citizenship and Immigration Services who will provide updates on some of these issues. But a significant outcome from last year for American Samoa was the administration's legislative proposal to provide reliable air service capabilities between the islands of Tutuila and Manoa. Already, the Office of Insular Affairs has provided $8.6 million for a new ferry to service between the two islands, which is expected to be completed by this summer. Lastly, 
We discussed compact impact aid, which is an issue that primarily affects the U.S. Pacific territories and the state of Hawaii. The Office of Insular Affairs has worked to improve efficiencies and the reporting and awarding of funds. We work with the Governor of Guam and Hawaii to establish Micronesian one-stop service centers last year. And we established a federal interagency working group composed of the Departments of Interior, Labor, Health and Human Services, Education, Housing and Urban Development, Defense, and State to explore long-term strategies to address compact impact aid. We look forward to working with other federal agencies and the U.S. Congress as many of the solutions would require statutory changes. This year's focus is on economic policy and development. The issues are whether certain federal economic policies need to be modified or improved to address the unique circumstances of the territories and what federal economic development grants and loan programs work or need improvement to better help the territories. I look forward to hearing directly from our governors and delegates who are here with us today to explain these issues in their respective jurisdictions. After their remarks, we will then move into a panel discussion between federal officials and territorial leaders. After brief presentations by the U.S. Departments of Treasury, Commerce, and Homeland Security, the Small Business Administration, and the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council, I would like to begin by calling on our first speaker, Governor Lolo from American Samoa. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary, the Honorable Secretary Jules, the Honorable Assistant to the President, Assistant Secretary Kiaena, Honorable Governors, delegates from Congress, various agencies who have supported the territories. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to at least uh, relate to you the issues that are being faced by territories at the present time. Uh, speaking directly for American Samoa, just briefly outline, some of you don't even know where American Samoa is. Actually, if you have a straight flight to American Samoa from the nation's capital, it would take you 17 hours of direct flight from here to American Samoa. And it's 10 to 11 hours from the West Coast to American Samoa and five or six hours from Honolulu to the south, then that will place American Samoa right in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> <laughs> not even closer to any of the major industrial centers in the world. The reason why I mention the distance as the major tyranny in our development is that we have assumed in, in my experience in Washington, that the Congress believe that American Samoa can fit in it at any size. The concept of one size fits all had never worked for us and never will. The reason why locating several hours away from the mainstream makes us very unique in any development that we try to make. Specifically speaking for American Samoa, the most recent dilemma that we are facing right now as I speak is the issue with our canneries. We are facing an uncertain future for the two canneries that we have in our territory. Canneries are reaching out to our local government for assistance, but we can only do so much. The help that they need is sitting right here in Washington. It's out of our reach and takes the federal government to come out and support our canneries in order for us to sustain those two canneries in American Samoa. I can predict those two canneries, if they cannot make money in the next five years, they will be out of our territory. Let me make a point on the pace of our economy in American Samoa. It's based on two major factors. 
One, are jobs that are being provided by the federal government and our local government that provides 50% of our economy. And the next 50% is provided by these two canneries. They employ over between five and 6,000 employees in American Samoa. And that's 50% of our workforce. Imagine one or two of these canneries leave. It will place us in a disastrous situation where we cannot afford to live. One of the major setbacks that I experienced in my three years as governor is the implication or the applications of federal mandates and federal policies in American Samoa. Not only that it doesn't meet and suit our needs, but it is interpreted in a way that it can only fit in states and territories closer to the mainstream USA. But for a small territory like American Samoa that sits thousands of miles away from, uh, from, uh, from, from the United States, we can feel the pinch and the impact of the distance and everything. For instance, if the peril of fuel costs 25 to 30 dollars before it gets to American Samoa, it's double or three times the cost of the fuel. And so is everything that comes to our island. It's the tyranny of distance that makes us unique and different from any territory or states in, 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 in our American family. There are some cases that I'd like to bring to your attention that is creating a lot of distress and commotion in our territory. And one of those is the decision by the Department of the Commerce Department that push our protective zone to the 12 mile instead of 50 miles. Our 50 mile protective zone is now being pushed by the Department of Commerce and NOAA to 12 miles, despite the overwhelming objection by our leaders and our people. There are several other cases that needs to be addressed and that's why I said the most, the biggest setback in, in, our, in any development is the application of federal rules and policies in American Samoa. One of the two canneries that left our territory, the reason why, is because of the application of the minimum wage into our territory. We were forced by Congress to apply a minimum wage that our economy cannot support. And that's why they fold and close Luckily enough, we were able to attract another cannery that helped us create a few more jobs, adding to the job force that we have today. The tyranny that we are facing today, and hopefully that the federal government will step in to maintain those incentives that used to be provided by, by the federal government, that will even up the playing field for canneries operating on U.S. soil. <clears throat> it is interesting to see the way people look at us in, in American Samoa. Several interpretations of who we are is very critical to our survival. Many times each federal agency defines us in any way they want. The immigration policies define us as non-Americans. FAA interpret our airport as an international airport only to apply those laws. The dilemma that we are facing, like I said, with the, the application of federal rules and policy does impact our, 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 our economy in a lot of ways. We cannot develop our tourism industry because the capital's concept apply to American Samoa. We cannot even fly one plane from, from, from American Samoa to Honolulu. Imagine that's why we're facing a lot of uh, uh, issues with our, with our development of our tourists. So all we are asking, 
the federal government to do is to provide us the assistance so that we can become on our own. Self-sufficient and self-reliance, I am pretty sure, is the intent of the federal government. And we cannot move forward to achieve that vision and goal unless we are given the privilege and release, relax some of those federal policies that ties our hand in terms of development. I can tell you a story when we tried to extend a small runway in Manua, one of the small islands that has a, a runway of 11 to 1,200 feet. So when we conducted the, pub, the hearing, somebody from, from the FAA or from NOAA told us you cannot extend the airport to that piece of land or, 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 or sea because the coral, the blue coral is growing there. You have to find a, another place to extend. That is the only available land for the land street. What I'm saying, defining us lesser important than cars is something we have to think about. And I'm pretty sure that is not the intent of the federal government. Priority to the pe lives of the people before any, anything else. Why I'm saying that is because a lot of developments that we wanted to do has been set back by the applications of federal policies and rules. Capital charge for one, removal of incentives for two, a lot of other reasons that the federal government interprets our existence in terms of what can be applied here, but not considering our situation back home. We're also in a dispute with the Federal Aviation uh, Agency in, in, in Samoa. Our case where they think our land that has been developed should be under the purview of the FAA knowing very well that our lands cannot, can only be owned by Samoans according to our local statute. Most of the, the federal policies do not have the respect for our local statutes and local mandates. <coughs> so that's why I brought the issue of the applications of federal policies as the number one setback in our economic development process. So due to the interest of time, I know I'm taking more than five minutes, but I have the contention from American Samoa who are all here trying to find solutions to our problems and to our issues in American Samoa. Being away for you know, a, a lot of th things. We, I can only bring this group once a year because of the cost. From Honolulu to American Samoa, it, uh, almost, one way is almost $1,000. Compare when you fly from Honolulu to San Francisco or, or LA, you can fly with a $200 or $300. But to pay almost $2,000 on a round trip from Honolulu to American Samoa, not only is outrageous, but it's unhuman. Just because the capital law prohibits <laughs> any foreign carriers to fly between Honolulu and American Samoa. We are asking if some of those federal mandates can be waived in order for us to develop our economy, then American Samoa within the next five, 10 years will not only become self-reliance, but it will no longer depend on the federal government to put up the resources for its existence. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Governor Lolo. Uh, you're gonna be able to query uh, uh, <coughs> several of the federal agencies that are here after your presentations. Uh, Governor Mapp of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Good morning. Uh, Secretary Jewell, Assistant Secretary Kayana, my good friend, Mr. Jerry Abramson, my fellow governors, uh, Governor Maliga, Governor Torres, my delegate to the Congress, Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett, uh, other representatives from the territories, from Guam, 
uh, and the fellow territories, I'd like to say I think it's good afternoon. And I only know it's good afternoon because I'm hungry. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> I'm certainly uh, very happy to, to be here to represent the people of the wonderful U.S. Virgin Islands. And I must say that um, I came into office a year ago and attended the work session at the White House with the, my fellow governors of the nation. And I stood up and I expressed some concerns to President Obama about some particular uh, federal issues affecting the economy and progress in the development of the infrastructure of the U.S. Virgin Islands. President Obama was very gracious and introduced me <coughs> to a gentleman in his office on his staff by the name of Jerry Abramson. And I would like to publicly start by thanking Jerry on behalf of the territory because what a wonderful year it has been. When I came into office, uh, there was just a complete disjointed connection between the government of the Virgin Islands and many of our federal agencies and partners. Much of our federal funds were in jeopardy. The federal inspector general wrote a number of reports, putting many of the grant programs, particularly having to do with the Environmental Protection Agency and other agencies, in jeopardy, and in some instances, recommending that the federal government close those programs and administer them themselves. In one year, we have made tremendous progress with our federal partners. And I want to thank Mr. Abramson personally, um, because each time that we have reached out to him, he has responded, and we've seen nothing but progress. I'd like to thank the Assistant Secretary. It's not all going to be rosy this morning, but I'd like to thank the Assistant Secretary also for her work in advancing the cause of the Virgin Islands. There's much work to be done, but we have made tremendous progress. The U.S. Virgin Islands has aligned itself with the U.S. Department of Energy. And in the President's mission to reduce carbon emissions and burn cleaner fuel and use more renewable energy um, in the nation, the Virgin Islands is very proud to say that we had created a target goal of 60 percent renewable energy by the year 2025. Currently, we have achieved one-third of that, or more than 20-odd percent of our energy production is generated by renewable energies. And with our work session in June with Secretary Moniz, it is very clear that we are going to meet the target way before 2025 as we continue our relationship with um, the, the U.S. DOE. Our work with the Environmental Protection Agency and the regional administrator uh, Judith Inc. has borne tremendous fruit for the Virgin Islands. Our federal funds and programs <coughs> under our local Department of Planning and Natural Resources on behalf of the EPA are no longer in danger. In point of fact, in December 18, 2015, we saw in one specific program a $4.5 million increase in the funds for that program. We have received over $6 million in reimbursements as far back as fiscal 2011 in resolving a number of the issues with the EPA. Our work with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC has borne again tremendous fruit. Uh, we have actually begun to struck an alliance with Secretary Burwell, who I've spoken to today, and uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is going to approve the, an IPA appointment of its regional administrator in New York, Dr. Michelle Davis, to actually serve in the cabinet of the government of the Virgin Islands as our territorial health officer as we deal with the issues that we will mention today having to do with the Zika virus, the lack of mental health services, addiction, uh, the abuse of opiates, and how that affects the quality of life in, in communities, our inability to service maternal and child health services, and seeing tremendous amount of these federal monies being returned and the people of the Virgin Islands not having access to them. The challenges in one of our local hospitals and being able to maintain its uh, certification under uh, the CMS for the ability to access and be reimbursed for Medicare and Medicaid payments, particularly when we are facing over $60 million annually of uncompensated care because of our inability to uh, have full access to the Affordable Care Act. 
We see tremendous advance and progress being done in the President's recent budget uh, that he's released, where the territories, and the U.S. Virgin Islands in particular, uh, may be able, if uh, approved by the Congress, to receive its Medicaid reimbursements equal to that of the U.S. mainland. Currently, our reimbursements are net 18 percent of cost, and that just wreaks tremendous havoc on the Treasury of the territory. Um, we have the 100-year centennial coming up in March of 2017. Madam Secretary, I'm glad to hear that you have made a decision to visit the Virgin Islands. I certainly had intended to, again, extend an invitation to you to visit uh, with us uh, to discuss a number of these issues. Uh, I am going to be meeting with members of the Senate uh, tomorrow evening who will be announcing a congressional commission on the centennial. And we need to, we want to be able to forge a stronger relationship with the executive branch on how we would go forward in making the best use of the 100th anniversary of the U.S. Virgin Islands coming into uh, the uh, nation, the U.S., uh, uh, the United States of America, not just to have a party and celebration, but to really look at our relationship in the last 100 years, look at how trade policies have affected uh, the, the fragile economies of the U.S. Virgin Islands, look at our education and on our health policies, so that when we look towards the next 100 years, we see sustained uh, growth and development, and the people of the Virgin Islands, without question, are fully patriotic to the United States. And I just say, as a point of history, it is the only jurisdiction that went to the Congress in 1959 to lobby for inclusion in the U.S. Uh, draft so that Virgin Islanders could serve in the military. And today, uh, we boast on, uh, it, it, it's a Don Quixote sort of uh, feeling, but we boast having the highest per capita uh, ultimate sacrifice of American uh, military personnel in the US Virgin Islands. And we have a reposed specific places in our cemeteries for veterans. And it is very clear upon entering those cemeteries that Virgin Islanders have gone abroad and served this nation with distinction. That brings us to our advance to uh, formulate our relationship with the U.S. Veterans Administration as veterans in the Virgin Islands are forced to travel abroad for basic health care services and needs. The, the territorial government uh, subsidized those costs and those services, and I must uh, uh, commend my local director of Veterans Affairs. We have had a meeting with some representatives of the U.S. Veterans Administration, and we're working towards this year, and we need your help to ensure that the Veterans Administration can, in fact, take uh, wings in our hospital facilities and be able to use them for providing veterans care. The uh, medical community has advanced medical care, and so uh, these large hospitals that we have on both islands have a lot of unused space, and so we seem like we're going to be able to make real good progress in having the Veterans Administration open clinics and base services within these facilities with their own personnel and provide for the many hundreds of veterans that live uh, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Our relationship with your U.S. Department of Justice uh, has also been equally strong. I was letting uh, General Lynch, the Attorney General, I was thanking her for uh, our ability to have such a strong relationship. A year ago, we had no local police officers embedded in, uh, with federal law enforcement operations in the U.S. Virgin Islands. A year ago, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Unit was not even present in the Virgin Islands. Today, just under 10 percent of Virgin Islands police officers are embedded in every federal law enforcement agency in the Virgin Islands. The ATF is back. And our relationship between my local Department of Justice and the U.S. Federal Department of Justice is strong and continuing to grow. We need your help with our relationship with Customs and Borders Protection. The 1954 Revised Organic Act provided that custom duties assessed and collected in the U.S. Virgin Islands shall be reposed in the Treasury of the Government of the Virgin Islands for the operation of the Government of the Virgin Islands. That worked very well pre-9-11. 
Post 9-11, with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, the costs and expenses of the operations of the Department of Homeland Security is now being taken from the revenues that are assessed and collected in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And if I'm, I will be having a meeting tomorrow with the Customs and Border, I believe, Commissioner, with my Commissioner of Finance, I believe that bill is now around $14 million a year, which is local monies. And the people of the Virgin Islands believe that the responsibility and administration and work of the Department of Homeland Security should be borne as it is in every other state and territory from the federal treasury and not from the treasury of the government of the Virgin Islands. We have no control on who's hired, what the costs and expenses are, but each year we simply get a, an agenda, an invoice, telling us that the amounts of monies collected um, are in fact uh, used for the total costs and expenses, and I believe some audit report is in fact showing that they're having some difficulty justifying those monies and that the current administration of that relationship is in violation of an MOU that we signed uh, several years ago. And so finally, in, in, and I know that I'm over time and I apologize, the Virgin Islands and, and Puerto Rico as well is uh, on the front line of the Zika virus. We are in the Caribbean. Uh, it's a warm climate. Mosquitoes love it. This is where uh, we see dengue, we saw chikungunya, and now we have confirmed cases in Puerto Rico and c growing confirmed cases in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The uh, comments of the Secretary of HHS at the President's workshop today was very, very heartening to hear, uh, and our concern that while we, the U.S. government is doing everything and is, is committed to assist both territories in education and protection of the citizens, in the territories we have, we live in the Caribbean, and I can walk right across from, literally walk from St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands in a canoe, or I can take a canoe, and in five minutes I'll be in the British Virgin Islands. And so when you look at St. Martin, St. Bart's, uh, the Dominican Republic, all of the islands that surround the U.S. Virgin Islands that are not U.S. jurisdictions, uh, mosquitoes do not have to clear TSA and immigration. And so uh, as we eradicate, as we uh, do protection, as we get rid of standing water, as we work with the EPA and our DPNR to get rid of tires and all of the elements that breed mosquitoes, some of the islands and the nations that surround us that are very close to us are not taking any of this mitigation. And uh, I'll end with this analogy, you know, in the U.S., uh, uh, in the Caribbean, turtle is a, a, has, used to be a wonderful staple on one's plate. And because of the endangered species and the protection of turtles, the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico fell into that maze where you could not harvest turtles. Well, we always say in the Virgin Islands that we raise turtles so the people in the British Virgin Islands can have a sumptuous meal because turtles don't always realize where they're coming on shore. And so it, it, it is the same thing with the mosquitoes. And so all that we can do in terms of helping those nations and in, in those independent nations that surround us to have the public education, to do the eradication and protect the citizens is actually an act for helping American citizens that live in both of the territories. So I'm going to end here and hope in a continuing discussion that we could talk about uh, dollars for infrastructure we can talk about clarification of source income on trade policy issues. Uh, and we want to be able, in this growing region of tourism in the Caribbean, where the numbers are now uh, showing we're having double-digit growth in the Caribbean region as across any other place on the planet, and some of it have to do with security concerns. We're finding more European travelers in, coming into the Caribbean region, but they're not really able to access uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands without having visas and all of the other uh, 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 clearances that are necessary. We're not saying waive them and eradicate them because we know safety and security, um, that, that does, that's not a good policy. But we, we want to be cl clear that we don't want to be carved out of a, the number one staple in the Caribbean, which is tourism, and we are unable to take part of, of the growing visitors in the region because our laws simply do not permit uh, day visitations, uh, even from around the Caribbean, or allow cruise ships and flights that are coming in from Europe that those persons cannot access to U.S. Virgin Islands because they have not 
apply to receive visas for uh, visitations when they're just passing through for a number of hours. So thank you, Secretary, Assistant Secretary Kayana, for your help in representing the territories. I, I love this report uh, on financial assistance to the affili uh, affiliated Pacific Islands, and I just hope that we can have one produced for the U.S. Virgin Islands that's 10%. <laughs> Uh, Governor, we're actually working on that as we speak. That was an uh, interagency effort on the West Coast. Sure. Uh, for our office, we realized the Virgin Islands is not included, and we are going to take care of that. 